Okay, lesson four is understanding the basic tuning techniques. Some basic things about tuning we want you to be aware of before we get into the details of how the optimizer works and looking at a detailed analysis of your SQL statements and that. So after the completing this lesson, you should be able to describe how to develop efficient SQL statements. And there will be a modest component of this is how to write SQL. It's not a big portion of the class, but it is an important section in this particular lesson. And then we'll examine some common mistakes, some things you want to avoid generally with your SQL. So lesson agenda, we're going to talk about developing efficient SQL as an overview. A little bit of a review of some of the things we've talked about and restated them for this lesson. And then we're going to talk about the script files used in this lesson. And then we're going to be spending a fair bit of time of looking at different exam and example code, example SQL statements that shows some common mistakes and some common issues you need to be aware of when you're working and writing SQL for the Oracle database. Okay. First up is developing efficient SQL. There are several ways you can view it. One way we've already mentioned is verify the optimizer statistics are up to date for the objects that we're working with our SQL on. Another one is review the execution plan, make sure they make sense in the context of the SQL statements we're using. Okay, sometimes selectively rewriting SQL statements or restructuring the tables and rewriting the statements allows us to, leads us to more efficient SQL. Sometimes adding indexes or restructuring indexes will help out. And one of the things we'll be very interested in have a look at is that some of the decisions you, the optimizer makes in selecting an SQL statement, and we'll get into the real details later, but some of the thing, times it can't use an SQL statement, and we'll talk about those in this chapter. Okay. Next up is we'll talk about modifying and disable triggers and constraint, particularly while you're doing bulk loads. That can lead to improved bulk loads and that. Next is restructuring the data. If you are in the divine phase, this may be doable. If the application is already in production, it's very difficult to retrofit it to practical applications, large applications realistically. It may take a major release before you can actually do this, but we'll look at some options in here. Okay, we'll also talk a little bit about maintaining uh, plan stability over releases. One way to do is hints, and we mentioned a few hints. There are over a hundred hints that you can use with SQL statements. Some of them are very specialized for, ver for special features of the database, and we don't spend time with them. We'll look at some of the more common ones as we go through different lessons, and we throw a few in here. Okay. And then finally, we have the principle that we should visit the data as few times as possible to solve a particular query. And then also, we should look at the least number of blocks we can at the same time to solve a query. Now, for this lesson, there are a group of script files that if you have access to a practice environment and are doing the practices, you can certainly look at these, and I use them to demonstrate some aspects. I certainly don't demonstrate every one. If not, we could wake this one chapter into a three or four day class on its own, but we'll look at a few of them. And there's one major script called createsqlt.shush that configures the demo environment. It's a little shush file that's run at the operating system level, and I'm going to demonstrate that in a few minutes, how you might want to run that. And this is particularly useful if you have access to a practice environment and want to have a look at some of these queries yourself. Okay. The next up is where they're located. So on the Linux boxes that we have, 
Under the Oracle home, that the directory happens to be slash home slash Oracle, there is a lab directory. It has a number of subdirectories as we saw when we had a look at the Explorer. And these live in the demo directory. Okay. The way these scripts were set up, they were expected to be executed using SQL Plus. The way they have them set up, they will create a trace file and then you need to go in. If you want to do it the way they do it, then you'd have to go in and run tkprof. And the main option they used was sys equals no to get rid of the curse of calls. Okay, and then you can have a look at it. A alternative way of having a look at it that I use for some of the demos is they've actually gone in and run them and produced the trace files and then they edited the trace files and removed most of the information from the trace files. The information at the top that identified. And we just give you the basic center of the trace file that shows you the information we're interested in have a look at. And that makes it a little faster to have a look at it. Unless they specify in their script files or in the comments, they're executing all of the scripts files from the SQLT user that gets created as part of this little script file called create underscore SQLT dot shush, our little script file. And it will connect to the database and run things for you. So what I'm going to do is stop the slides and we're going to switch over and have a look at a terminal session. So we'll just shrink that down and we'll have a look at the terminal session. Okay. And to create a terminal session on these nodes, they have an icon on the desktop, which is the easiest way. We just need to double click. You can also find it under the applications and go down, drill under there and under the uh, system tools, you also find the terminal, but instead of doing the menu search, which is a little time consuming, what we can do is just double click on the terminal. It will bring it up, okay? And then we need to run the script file. So I'm just pulling up the information about it in another session so I can have a look at it. It will take me a moment to do that. So what we don't want to do is set the environment to our database. Make sure if you do this, put the dot space in. It is significant on a Linux box. If you're on Windows, you might not be used to that. What it does is that we want to set a bunch of environment variables. Normally, Linux will spawn another shell, let you do something, and then come back to your original. That was because Linux and Unix was originally imagined as a development environment. And if your C program broke or some other script broke, we didn't want you to get logged off the session, so they spawn it. What we, if you do that to create environment variables, they get created in the other session, they're not available in my original one. Putting the dot space allows it to run in the same shell. So we're going to run Aura Environment, which is a little utility we give you with the database. It gets put in the default user bin directory, so it's always available to the users. And then you have to put the database, the default SID, the, you need to put the Oracle SID for the database, session ID. The default one they put in is ORCL. We're using SysTune in our environment for the database. So we'll need to type in SysTune. It says the Oracle base remains un unchanged, but now if I echo the Oracle underscore SID, it has set it for my database. It also has set the Oracle uh, home variable for my database. It actually used the one from before. So this is the full path to the Oracle home. And we also updated the path to include the bin subdirectory from this Oracle home directory. So now all of the tools are available. Okay, the next thing we want to do is these script files live in the slash uh, Oracle home slash labs and under demos. So I can cd labs to the labs directory. If I do ls, it will show me there's a group of things we saw earlier on using the little explorer tool. And I want to cd to demo. Okay. 
Look in there, there are all sorts of script files we created. Okay, some of them are shell scripts, including the create SQLT. Some of them are SQL script files. There is also another little directory, which is the output files, that we'll have a look at as we do some of this. Okay, so now we want to execute this file. It's a script file. We can execute it by just putting dot slash execute it out of the directory I'm in. And the file I want to do is the create. If I just hit CR tab, it will fill it in and until it becomes long, a non-unique, just for people like me that don't like typing too much. If you're a typist and you like to type the whole thing in as long as you type it correctly. And this will take a few minutes to run. From what I remember, it takes about four to five minutes to run. It's connecting to the database and it's going to add a table space for that little user add. And it will get some error messages that says the user doesn't exist, the table space. That's perfectly all right. We made it so if you re-execute it, it will drop them. If they don't, it gives a sort of a soft error. It just keeps going. So it just takes a few minutes to execute. So we'll let it go ahead and run. Now it's importing some data into the database as it's going through it to put some information we want in there. It was just a convenient way of reloading the data for this particular schema. And it's going to create also another set of tables. A lot of them are created as selects from the tables in the SH schema, the HR schema, etc. Just copies that we can play with without making changes to the other ones as we're doing demos within this lesson. So it takes it a few moments to do it. It's also including the statistics so we know what the statistics look like as we're doing tests in these. And those are some of the tables that are just copies of the tables from the sample schemas that they included in their export file that they created for this account. Uh, they just went through and run the portion of the script that deletes a bunch of uh, indexes that came with the tables from the sample schemas because we wanted to have a controlled set of indexes as we did the different practices. So it goes in and creates a group of indexes that they want to use after creating a couple of tables, three tables. And when we get the command prompt back, we can hit return, it's completed. Now we're going to go back to the lecture material and talk a little bit about uh, some of these examples. And then we're going to be switching back and forth between the lecture material and the practice material in this lesson. So we talked about this process of setting it up and how they leave them. And this is our first example. And the first one is example one is talking about how a table redesign can actually affect the execution. And these all have the same sort of thing. We're going to have one or more queries okay, in here that is going to be looking at something in the SQL statement. And then we're going to have some information about what indexes are available on which tables we're using. So in this case, at the top, we have the information about the index that says we have a customer's table. Okay, On the customer's table, we have a index on the postal code. Okay, And the postal code on this table, on the customer's table, is stored as one varchar postal code just as a single column postal code. We also have a second table called the postal codes table. And in there, we also have the postal code, but now it's broken up across two columns. We have a couple of digits in code one and a couple of digits in code two. So we have an index called the postal code PK. PK is our short form for primary key index. For this, we also have an index on this one. And what we want to illustrate a problem when we have to use a function on it, because this one is broken up into two pieces, 
This one is in one piece. The data is stored differently. That actually causes a problem with the executing the SQL statement. The query we want to execute is a join between the customer's table and the postal code table. And it's going to be an equal join, but we have to wrap one side with a substring. We have indexes on both sides of the postal code, but the data is stored differently. Okay, So the postal code is the first two digits of the postal code, which is stored on the postal code table as code 1. Okay, the we want to match that to two digits out of the postal code, which is stored as a single column. So we're going to use a substring to do that, and it's a function. If this is a regular index, it may cause us problem when we use a function. We wrap the column with a function. It will not be able to use the index generally. And to equate it to the postal code, we have to do the same thing, except for it's the last two digits, the last three digits, starting in position three for three digits, or three characters. So we're doing a substring. We also have additional filters. Okay, we have postal code one equals 67, and country code equals 5278. When they did this, it does use an index. It uses the postal code PK okay, index, but it doesn't use the index on the postal codes table. That PK index is the one over here, is the one on the postal codes table. It can't use this index because we wrapped it with the substring functions. So that's a problem. Can we find a way to make it work? And there is some possibilities. The big problem is we have the data stored two different ways in the two different table. One table has one varchar, the other table has two varchars. If we make them the same, then we wouldn't have to use the substring function. So what we're going to look at is a number, a couple of ways of making them the same. And they've already have some examples of doing this, so I just use their examples. Okay, so there are a couple of tables, a couple of uh, things I want to have a look at. One is we have the output data, that was the subdirectory under the demo data, and we have some output for this. Okay, this was the first one. And we have the information in the demo directory. So these are our example SQL statements. 